a continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a very great multitude, Bartimaeus, the blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside begging, who, when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, began to cry out and to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him that he might hold his peace. But he cried a great deal the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus, standing still, commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of better comfort, to rise, he calleth thee. Who, casting off his garment, leaped up and came to him. And Jesus, answering, said to him, What wilt thou that I should do to thee? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may see. And Jesus said to him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he saw and followed him in the way. So far the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. You may be seated. Peace be to you and welcome to this, our mission, climbing the mountain of God. I hope you receive many, many graces for coming tonight. This morning at Mass, we reflected on the imagery of Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. This imagery that he gives us is of a valley. Then there's a pit, that's the Inferno. Then there's a mountain, the Purgatorio, that leads to Paradise, Paradiso. Now, it's this model that... Dante Alighieri gives us is based upon divine revelation. As we mentioned today at Mass, the book of Tobias, our Lord says through Tobias, For thou scourgest and thou savest, thou leadest down to hell and thou bringest up again. This is important because if St. John the Baptist is to be our guide this week, which I promised you he would uh, this morning, then he must rely only on that which is revealed from above. It's a very important point. He himself said, St. John the Baptist, this is St. John's Gospel, a man cannot receive anything unless it be given him from heaven. A man cannot receive anything unless it be given him from heaven. We also know that John came for a witness to give testimony of the light that all men might believe through him. He was not the light, but was to give testimony to the light. We hear that at the last gospel at every Mass. He is to give knowledge of salvation to his people, his father Zachary said, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He is to give knowledge of salvation to his people unto the remission of their sins, to enlighten them that sit in darkness and to shadow of death and to direct our feet into the way of peace. So, what I'm saying is this. We are not here to give you our opinions. We're here to give you truths based solidly upon divine revelation, truths that come from above. Because as I was saying at Mass this morning, so many people looking for shortcuts and all these solutions, and ultimately they're not going to work because they don't come from above. So if we really want the truth solutions that are going to solve our problems, help us find peace of soul, we need to look up. That's the solution. Now in the gospel, we just heard about the blind man Bartimaeus. This is one of the many places in the scriptures given to us that this mountain theme is on display. Dante captures it. It's here. It's in this, in this gospel I read today. Here's some considerations. What is this way that Jesus was going? It said he was on his way. What's this road? Well, the next verse of the gospel tells us. So what I read to you today was at the very end of the 10th chapter of St. Mark's gospel. Now go to the beginning of the 11th chapter. This is what you'll read. And when they were drawing near to Jerusalem and to Bethania at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village that is over against you, and immediately on coming in there, thither, 
you shall find a colt upon which no man has yet sat. Loose him and bring him. Do you recognize that? Of course you do. This Palm Sunday. So he's down in the valley. He's up on the top of the mountain all of a sudden. At Jerusalem. So we see that our Lord is heading to his passion. That is the way. His passion, death, and resurrection. This is his exodus out of the world that he discussed with Moses and Elias on Mount Tabor. At the transfiguration. This is the goal of our Lord. This is the way. Yet, this gospel, the one I read to you, has him starting this fate-filled journey at Jericho. Now, let's think about this. What's this Jericho place? This is the ancient city of Jericho. Did you know it's the lowest city in the world? It's the lowest city in the world. Something like 900 feet below sea level. Now, Jerusalem is something like 3,500 feet up the mountain. So he started out below sea level. And the path is not an easy one. Often there are robbers lurking around. It's got these little nooks and crannies and all kinds of places where people can hide. So if you recall the parable of the Good Samaritan, if you remember, that parable has a man starting in Jerusalem And he's going down to Jericho. And what happens to him? Well, he's waylaid by robbers, which symbolize the demons. Okay, so it's a dangerous road. And he was going down. And that's what happens when you have no guide. He was alone. The man was by himself. Now, it seems clear to me that this gospel imagery gives us an easy way to view Christ's work of redemption and salvation. It's all there. We can understand many things from this image that is in keeping with how God made things. Now, let's just give a few historical examples so that you can see what I'm saying. Okay. Now, in speaking to Abraham, God called himself El Shaddai. That means God of the mountain. El Shaddai. Where did Abraham often meet with God? On a mountain. Abraham nearly sacrificed his son on Mount Moriah, son Isaac. He interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah from a mountain height. Then there was Moses on Mount Sinai. Moses died on Mount Nebo. St. Elias performed his miracles and saw the prefigurement of Our Lady in the cloud while on Mount Carmel. He then had his most intimate meeting with God on Mount Horeb. The temple was built on Mount Zion. We heard today that our Lord went on the mountain with his disciples and he fled to the mountain to pray. He preached his greatest sermon from a mountain. He discussed his exodus from the world on Mount Tabor and he died on Mount Calvary. We know the third part of the secret of Fatima, the part that was revealed to us is about a mountain with a cross on top. Why does God use this mountain imagery? It's very simple. One of the first requirements for eternal life is knowing up from down. It's so simple. Once again, I'm going to repeat this. This is one of those lines. You've got to get your marker out and mark this one. You know, highlight it. One of the first requirements for eternal life is knowing up from down. Believe me, that's big. That's a tall order for people today. Because people today don't believe there's an up and a down. This is a problem. Well, these basic orientations immediately evident to our senses regulate everything that we believe. Everything that exists. Our Lord Jesus Christ, does he not speak of the Son of Man descending from heaven and ascending back up to heaven? Once again, it seems to me that the story of Bartimaeus captures the essential elements of the scriptural mountain theme. We start down by the Jordan, outside of the city of Jericho. Now, Jericho has long been held by the fathers to symbolize the city of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The lion, the leopard, and the wolf, and the other beasts, they have this as their home. 
It is the haunt of Satan and the home of revolutionary men. That's scary. It is Egypt with all its technologies, pleasures, sounds, smells, foods, passions. It is down in the valley, 900 feet below sea level. And it's pumping out all kinds of toxic stuff. Smog. Filth. You know what? <laughs> We're in that smog. Every time you turn TV on, there it is. We breathe this stuff in every day. It's toxic. Books, movies, sounds causing much confusion, diabolical disorientation. The pseudoscience of evolution is just one important example. Put a little bookmark there. We're going to bring that up another time. Evolution. The distracting and subtly harmful popular literature like Harry Potter is another. Yoga, Reiki, the nihilists, the relativists, the hedonists, the naturalists, the spiritualists, the New Agers, they all find their home down there. And they don't get along with each other so much, but you know what? They all agree on one thing. Don't go up that mountain and don't look up. You know, in the French Revolution, they had this notion that they had the, 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 the Congress there in the French Revolution was divided into left and right. And they said there were no enemies to the left. So if you look on your mountain map, you'll see that Jericho is on the edge of an abyss. It's at the left. The inferno, that pit or lake of burning fire that the little children at Fatima, they saw the earth opened up and it was down there. Hell is below the surface of the earth. It's awful hot down there. It's a burning lake of fire. And it's in the center of the earth. And the souls that are unwilling to leave the city, they die in it and they slide into the abyss. So that at one end of our picture, once again, in the left side, hmm, this is where all those people dwell. In a city on an edge of the abyss, 900 feet below sea level. And they all agree that they're against this mountain. And that's how they can exist in the city together. Now, this is where mankind starts out. How did we get down there? Why do we have to start down there? How did this happen? Well, because Adam sinned. He left Jerusalem the city of God on the mountain, and went down to Jericho. If you don't know that uh, parable of the Good Samaritan, that's about Adam. He's the man that left Jer- or Jer- Jerusalem and went down to Jericho. He went down to Jericho. He was waylaid by robbers, the devil and his minions. And after having their way with him, they stripped him of his graces, his original justice, his preternatural gifts, And he was thrown into a ditch, and that ditch was the deepest valley in the world. In other words, when he fell from grace due to original sin, he didn't just fall down to the level of nature. That would be sea level. No, he fell below nature. This is the scary part about man. We can fall below nature. This has scared the philosophers all the way from the very beginning. That man can fall that far. In other words, Adam and his children would suffer from many effects of sin that made them worse than animals. How can I say that? Animals have no malice. We do. We can be malicious. That's frightening. You ever run up against a malicious will? Exorcists do all the time. It's one of the most frightening experiences It's like hitting a brick wall. Well, the good Samaritan came along. That's Jesus Christ. And he provided the remedy. A way back up the mountain. A way back into the heavenly city of God, the new Jerusalem. We have the inn, which is the church. He brings fallen Adam to the church. So nearby the city of Jericho is the Jordan River. Through its waters we lead behind Jericho. By washing its dirt from our souls, as Jesus said, Amen, Amen, I say to thee, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he must be born from above, from water pouring over his body, the 
cleanse his soul. So in the story, Bartimaeus has left the worldly city but knows not where to go. He is blind. He can only sit there outside the city. Then he is moved by God to ask for his sight, which symbolizes baptism, wherein the faith is given to his soul. So the fathers of the church identify what happens to Bartimaeus as baptism. It's a a symbol of baptism, the effect of baptism. This is redemption. This is what redemption is. Once we have faith, then we see the top of the mountain as Dante had seen it, bathed in light. Redemption gives us faith hope and charity. Now we know there's a mountain. Now we can look up. Now we can see the mountain bathed in light and we know where to go. So after our redemption, after this cleansing, we must work out our salvation, which is the fullness of redemption. Salvation and redemption are not the same. The Protestants fall into that error. They think they are. So we ask ourselves, are you saved? And you should say, and I'm sure you all do, not yet. I'm on the way. Are you saved? We must climb the mountain of God to be saved, to be completely united to Christ on the cross. That's why I gave you that map. This is the thing that's going to change your life. If you look at that map, it'll all make sense. What the Catholic faith is about. We must die with Christ so that we can rise with him and see God face to face. St. Paul says, Romans, you can look it up, chapter 6. Know you not that all we who are baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized into his death? For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, St. Paul. Chapter 6, Romans. What he's saying is that when you're baptized, you're down at the bottom. But when you're baptized, you're baptized into this reality. It's at the top. You need to make it from here to here. When you're baptized, you're obliged to get here. To make it to Calvary. This is shown in the gospel by how our Lord tells Bartimaeus to go his way. What is that way? There's only one way, and that is up. That is the direction from which he was reborn in baptism. He must follow Christ up the mountain, for he is the way, the truth, and the light. So this is what he did. The gospel says he followed him in the way. Now recall that the great multitude was with him, so we go together. We're in the church We walk up this mountain together. It's not a one thing. It's not just me and Jesus. Another arrow of the Protestants. So we belong to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now, what if Bartimaeus, he sees that this is the way in which he did, and he's following Christ, which he did, but we don't read about Bartimaeus at Calvary, do we? What happened to him? He didn't make it. He died on the way. Somewhere. So what happens when you die on the way? Well, you still have to be crucified. You still need to be crucified. It's inescapable. He still needs to make it to the summit of Calvary and to die with Christ. So let's be very clear. This is another one of those sentences you want to get your highlighter out for. And underline. Everyone must be crucified no matter what. And those who do so while still in the flesh... They become saints. They don't need to go to purgatory. This is why St. Paul repeats himself in his letter to the Galatians. They that are Christ have crucified their flesh with the vices and concupiscences. And he says in another place, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. And he says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus Christ crucified. Doesn't he say that? The stigmata. This is why Padre Pio got the stigmata. God wanted to show the world this is what it means to be united to me and to be a Catholic, to be on the cross. That's what he's saying. Now, those who resist God and do not finish the job on earth, well, they need to be crucified in purgatory for a time, but without any merit, get no credit for it. Doesn't bring any glory to God either. 
But what of those who remain in Jericho? They're eternally crucified in hell. You see this? Everyone will be crucified. End of story. No exceptions. Everyone must be crucified. That's our Catholic faith. It's inescapable. Everyone will be a stigmatist. Period. All of us will bear the marks of Jesus Christ. Either eternally in hell, under their pain and shame, or eternally in heaven to glory. So let's imitate our Lord and let's set our faces like flint toward Jerusalem, toward Calvary, saying, get behind me, Satan, to anything that gets in our way. And that's hard to do. Because some of those things are fun. They feel good. And I want to keep them around. Once again, we need a guide. We can't direct ourselves. We'll make a mistake. So we need to get our directions straight. We need the way up. And that's the way to Calvary, the way of the cross. That's up. And up is where heaven is, the other side of the mountain, the right side. The reward of reaching the summit is heaven. Now, this looking up to heaven is very much to the point of God's mountain, as we learn from the shepherd children of Fatima. When they received a light of of love and grace from our blessed mother's hands, it penetrated into the innermost intimate recesses of their souls and they could see God in themselves and themselves in God. What happened to those little children as they looked up and saw God? It was a foretaste of heaven. Suddenly, all things in the world became vain, empty. It became to them as nothing. These are children. They matured overnight. Just think, oh, to receive one of those graces. Blessed Mother, point those hands toward us. We need one of those graces. Well, St. Augustine famously said, Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in Thee. So God made our hearts for himself and they will not find rest or satisfaction in anything other than God himself. Let's listen to St. Therese. She said, I've received God's mercy. Okay, I've received some pretty good graces. That's what she's saying. She's not satisfied. Listen to her words. I've received God's mercy, but I await his infinite mercy. Infinite mercy. To be happy, we must have the infinite. We will never be happy without it. We must possess God. This is the most important thing to understand about heaven and eternal life, about the top of the mountain, about reaching heaven. We must have the infinite. We'll never be happy otherwise. It's all about God if we think about that. If it's about the infinite, we must possess God, then that means it's all about God. Hmm. It's a doctrinal truth that God only finds happiness in himself and because of himself. God is completely happy before creation. He wasn't lonely. He's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He didn't need us. He does not need us. And he still doesn't need us. God's completely happy. He found, this happiness flows from God knowing and loving himself. The Father knows the Son. The Son knows the Father. And from this act of knowing comes forth loving. It's the Holy Ghost. This act of knowing and loving in God brings eternal, unbounded happiness to Him. And we will only find eternal, unbounded happiness by entering into the very same act of knowing and loving in God. And this is what heaven is in its essence. Once again, it's about God. It's about knowing and loving God. Heaven is loving God with the love with which He loves Himself. All else is secondary and accidental. Once again, this is the most important thing to understand about heaven and eternal life. I've said it once, twice, maybe three times. I'll say it again. It's all about God. Listen to a blessed. It's the Carmelite blessed. Not one action of the individual will take place there that is not ordained for the manifestation of God's glory and the glory of the whole church. End quote. 
Now, unfortunately, and I bring this all up for this reason, we tend to think of heaven in terms of its benefits, all the goods we will have there. What's in it for me sort of thinking. Many people, including groups like the Mormons, the Muslims, think of heaven in terms of a paradise for our bodies and our souls, banquets, fleshly pleasures, gardens, music, etc., etc. This is selfish and it smells of Jericho. It's natural, material. And I think we can fall into that pretty easy ourselves. So the essence of heaven is actually complete selflessness. In heaven, it's a sea of love and you want to give everything. You don't care about yourself. You want to give all you've got. Seeing God and entering into his one act of knowing and loving, that's heaven. And all things are added unto them that arrive. There are things that the human mind is incapable of conceiving. They have the creator himself and all creation with them. So then heaven has some lessons for us. In heaven, all the saints and everyone in heaven is a saint. They're all turned toward God. They're all fixed on God. They all face God. They can never turn away from God. There's no good powerful enough to turn them away from the infinite good. Cannot be distracted because they're fixed in God. So you're not going to be up in heaven seeing God and then saying, uh, just a minute, God, I got to talk to Father Gordon over here. You can't do that. You wouldn't want to do it. So if I want to talk to Father, I'll talk to him through God. You never turn from God. Thus, as the faithful make progress in becoming saints here on earth, they begin to understand more and more that the essential thing is to know and to love God. To keep one's focus on heaven above. And if they persevere, this leads them to make their whole life one continuous act of love of God. Okay. Now, how does that fit into what I was saying before about making it to the top of the mountain being crucified? Well, here, here's how it fits in. How do I show God that I love him? By doing what he did to show us his love. Sacrifice. In this universe that he made, sacrifice is the way we show love. That's it. That's how this universe is made. This leads the faithful soul to embrace the most difficult tasks and even the most painful martyrdoms. Think about those little children at Fatima. Once again, these were children. They were willing to do unbelievable penances for their age and even for our age. They were willing to undergo painful martyrdom. They really thought they were going to be martyred by being boiled alive in oil. They didn't care. For God, I'll do it. Nothing was too hard for them. Because they loved God. They had a taste of heaven. It was deep in their souls. So far from wanting to store up more things for life on earth, the faithful soul is ready to be dissolved and to be with Christ. He wants to give everything away. Be done with the world. For such holy souls, heaven is no longer about being free of all worldly trials, but being united to God forever. In other words, they have come to realize once again that life is not about them, but about God. Completely selfless. Amazingly, this led St. Therese to wonder about there being no suffering in heaven. This is truly amazing. Why is that, we should ask? Because she wanted to show God her love for him, even in heaven. How else can we do this but by making sacrifices? Listen to her words. Here's Therese. Oh, how happy I am to die. Yes, I am happy. Not because I shall be set free from the sufferings of this life. Suffering, on the contrary, is the only thing that seems desirable in this valley of tears. But because I really feel that this is the will of God. She says, ah, if you could only look into my soul for a few moments, how surprised you would be. The thought of heavenly happiness not only doesn't cause me one bit of joy. 
I even wonder sometimes how it will be possible to be happy without suffering. No doubt Jesus will change my nature. Otherwise, I would regret leaving suffering and this valley of tears behind me is the only thought of doing God's will that fills me with joy. End quote, St. Therese. Amazing that she thought that she wouldn't be happy without being able to offer sacrifice to show love. There it is. This is our Catholic faith. Now, many saints experience these same thoughts, and we can maybe think to ourselves, when we'll know when we're ready for heaven when we have those thoughts. Are we embracing suffering for the love of God? Nothing's too hard for us. We're not ready for heaven then yet, if we can't do that. But think about the paradox of it all. Those in hell. Hmm? What about those people in hell? And it's populated down there. Those in hell sought to escape suffering all their lives and now live with it for all eternity. Those in heaven willingly embraced sacrifices and sufferings and wondered how it is that they could not do more of the same in heaven. When we reach this stage, we will know we are ready for heaven. Now, tonight, we've laid down the foundation of our mission on climbing the mountain of God. We've learned that God is a mountain God. He's El Shaddai. And that if we're going to be with him, we must look up. We must climb to be crucified with Christ so that we will rise with Christ. To make this more real to ourselves, then I'm going to consider, make a few considerations on how to practice and play heaven now. Do you know that? You can play heaven. You know, little kids, they they play mass. They play these little games. We can play heaven. We should. So let's see what we can do about playing heaven, practicing for heaven here on earth. Now, you can look at the opposite of what I'm going to tell you, and that would be preparing for hell. So we have your choice. I can either practice for hell, or I can practice and play heaven. Now, in St. Matthew's Gospel, this is the first point. I'll make five points. In St. Matthew's Gospel, we read, In the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Hmm. How can I practice for heaven in this way? Well, the angels do not marry, but live in one family with all the saints, with God as their father and Mary as their mother. Now, this is realized perfectly as can be done on earth in religious life. In fact, religious are really practicing for heaven and playing heaven. That's what they do. That's our vocation, to play heaven. And this is why religious life, the revolutionary men of Jericho, they hate religious the most. So all throughout the history of a revolution, what's the first thing they want to eliminate? Religious life. You knock that playing in heaven stuff off. We don't want anybody to be following your example. And so they do everything they can to suppress religious. Get rid of religious and you will ruin the faith of the people. Because these these religious are playing heaven. Well, how do religious play heaven? Well, they take the vow of perfect chastity for the sake of the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven. Yet all who live chastely according to their state in life, they're practicing for heaven. So chastity is playing heaven. You get it? In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They're like angels in heaven. Don't want to go to heaven? Don't want to play heaven? Fiddle around with breaking your chastity. You're inviting devils. Number two, in heaven, all share the same reward in possessing God and all are enriched by each other as well. Like I said, love shares all. Love love wants everybody to have everything. Love empties itself of all such that all are enriched. Once again, this is best realized in religious life because they call nothing their own by taking a vow of poverty. 
Yet all of the faithful are called to live not only for themselves or this world by using their goods for God's glory and the good of the church. They can do that. We can practice for heaven even as lay folk by how? Giving alms. Giving alms is practicing for heaven. Poverty, properly understood, even embraced by the lay people, is practicing for heaven. Want to go to heaven? Practice. Give alms. Live a chaste life. Number three. Those in heaven do not sleep. They're always praising, loving, and serving God. The religious is already somewhat in the next life. His occupation is to what? Contemplate divine thing? That's canon law. The religious is to contemplate divine things. Seek assiduous union with God in prayer. To praise God and to build up the kingdom of heaven. This is his primary work. That of prayer. Okay. Since he seeks to live the heavenly life, the religious is playing heaven. What's he do? He gets up in the middle of the night. And he gets up early in the morning. He prays all throughout the day. Because they never sleep in heaven. So praying is practicing for heaven. So you want to practice for heaven? Pray. Not just at mass. Not just before meals. Pray. Pray frequently. Want to practice for hell? Don't pray. Number five or number four. Even those who have no... or even Everybody in heaven doesn't have a body, right? They don't eat there. Thus, fasting, too, is a way to practice for heaven. By fighting the battle of the belly, the resurrection takes a deeper hold on our hearts. Now, this opens the heart to receive the heavenly food of light and grace, enabling us to feast upon God. So fasting is practicing for heaven. Yes, it's painful. But you know what? If you take that attitude, when I fast, I'm practicing for heaven. That's going to be good. It's going to make it better. Try it. Finally, number five, this is a very important one. The saints in heaven are happily fixed in God, as we mentioned. They no longer make choices. Once again, this is captured in religious life by the vow of obedience. They're, as it were, nailed to the cross with Christ through obedience, the threshold of heaven. Now, we can start to put this uh, into our own life by putting God first in all things. Is this for the glory of God? We ask ourselves. So our auto, our motto ought to be all for Jesus with a smile. Are we doing it for the love of God? We can practice fixing our wills in God by adhering completely to the teachings of the church and all her traditional disciplines and by obeying legitimately established authority. Once again, as we said at Mass, there is one fatherhood. There's God the Father. Then there's the Holy Father. Then there's our fathers, the bishops. Then there's the fathers of our priests. Then there's our biological fathers. And it's all one fatherhood. And they participate in that one fatherhood depending on where they are in the hierarchy. And we practice for heaven by submitting to them. Unless it be sinful. And it's never sinful to obey in the teachings of the church and her traditional disciplines. It's very traditional to obey and love your father. That's practicing for heaven. Want to practice for hell? Spurn your father. That smells of hell. It's horrible. Read the lives of the saints. Even if their fathers were difficult, they didn't spurn them in any way. Next, we must then, after giving ourselves to God our Father through these fathers He's given us, submitting ourselves to God, then we submit ourselves to our neighbor, putting them before our own selves. Put our neighbor before ourselves for the love of God, And this will produce a joy that I tell you is a foretaste of heaven. Jesus first, other second, yourself last. J-O-Y. Spells joy. You can do it.
By playing heaven in this way, we're seeking first the kingdom of God. We are looking up and climbing. God tells us that for such a one, he will add unto him all things. And neither eye has seen nor ear has heard or the mind conceived just what these wonderful things are. Thank you for listening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Back in 1989, the funeral mass was offered for the repose of a very famous person named Zita. Zita at one time had been the empress of all of Austria and the Queen of Hungary. She was a widow who had been married to Charles I, the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The empress Zita was the mother of eight children who was wrongly deposed from her rightful throne and forced into exile. The body of this woman was brought to the Cathedral of St. Stephen in Vienna in April of 89, where a four-hour-long traditional funeral mass was offered, complete with Mozart's Requiem. 6,000 mourners were in attendance in the church and 50,000 Austrian citizens lined the streets near the church to say goodbye to their empress. After the funeral mass, the body was taken to be buried in the vault in a crypt church where many members of the royal family of the Austro-Hungarian Empire are buried. And when the coffin was brought to the door of the cemetery, an ancient ritual began. A man, Paul Bearer, leading the funeral procession, knocked at the door. Behind the door, a voice was heard saying, Who wishes to enter here? The Paul Bearer then began to list all the titles of this woman in the casket. The Empress Zita wishes to enter here. The Empress of all Austria, the Queen of Hungary. But the response from behind the door was, I don't know this person. Go away. Then the, can, the ritual continued, and the pallbearer knocked a second time, and then a response from behind the door, who wishes to enter here? The pallbearer this time was insistent. This is the apostolic queen of all Hungary. This is the empress of all Croatia and Bohemia. But the man behind the door again responded, I don't know this person. Go away. And finally, a third knock and a third response, and this time, with the proper response from the pallbearer. Who wishes to enter here? The pallbearer then gave the humble answer. We come with our sinful woman, a a sinful mortal, our sister, the Zeta. At this humble response, the gates of the crypt church were opened to take the body of Zeta to its rest. Earthly fame, earthly riches may make you a somebody on this earth, but it ultimately makes you a nobody before Almighty God. We cannot boast of anything before the good Lord, for we are dust, and unto dust we will definitely return. Now, as many of you might know, the Catholic Church has always forbidden, and that's the word, forbidden eulogies at Catholic funerals. In fact, an archbishop recently stated, eulogies or any extended remembrances of the dead always results in forgetting about Christ the Lord. Christ is the focus. And we pray that by the power of His death and His resurrection, that that departed soul will be saved from hell and will be brought either immediately or eventually through the gates of heaven. The main problem with eulogies, and we know about this, is that you always have to be positive, for no one would want to hear anything critical about the deceased. You don't speak ill of the dead. But this mandatory praise of the departed is often accompanied with the assistance that this particular deceased person is now in a very privileged place above. In addition, we constantly hear the refrain that the deceased is no longer suffering. But what do we refer to those people who are in that temporary holding cell called purgatory? They're members of the church suffering. And before they come to heaven and the church triumphant, they are enduring pains beyond human description. This canonization process at modern funerals does the faithful departed a great disservice because most likely he is in desperate need of our prayers. 
outside of the glory of Almighty God, the main purpose of every funeral mass is to give comfort for the deceased. Secondarily, to give comfort to those who are left behind. Let me remind all of us gathered here this evening, including myself, that heaven and eternal life are not our natural birthright. We don't deserve eternal salvation, naturally speaking, and in pure justice, we are not owed eternal rest. Heaven is not a natural end to our life on earth, and no work of man, no human riches, no earthly fame, and no merely human deeds will give us entrance to that which is above. The Holy Bible states, naturally speaking, that we are children of wrath, and that if we are deserving of anything of ourselves, it is only eternal damnation. The only thing that truly pleases the good Lord, the Almighty, is the life of His divine Son, Jesus Christ, in our souls. When we are in the state of sanctifying grace, when we have God's divine life within our souls, when mortal sin is not present, then, and only then, are we truly worthy of eternal life in Christ. Heaven is a supernatural goal. And only those with a supernatural outlook and supernatural life within them can reach that mountain peak above. I think that most of us are familiar with the story of the Tower of Babel. The Holy Bible tells us that the descendants of Noah became extremely wicked. And they began to build a very tall tower, a man-made mountain, if you will, that would not only help them escape any future floods that God might send them, but also that they might reach heaven above in order to gain glory for themselves and not for God. But this monument for the glory of men was remaining unfinished because the good Lord frustrated these foolish designs by confusing the language of the human race. These prideful architects, these prideful builders of the Tower of Babel were seeking to reach the heights of heaven above relying on their own natural powers and natural skills without acknowledging that any true elevation, any true perfection of man, any true enlightenment, and even heaven itself especially, cannot be reached without the help of God, without God being the first cause. This attempt to seek elevation, to seek enlightenment and human perfection by sidestepping the good Lord, reminds us of actually the original sin of Adam and Eve, our first parents. They stole the forbidden fruit, we know, because the serpent said to them that if they but ate that fruit, they would be truly godly and completely self-reliant. But with this sin, the gates of heaven were closed, and no human ingenuity, no human construction project could ever bring us to that goal of eternal life above. Only a mountain that was made by the very hand of God. And our willingness to climb this one and only mountain could bring us to paradise above. Mankind, the human race, you and me, are the most unique creatures on this earth. We are different from any other creature on the planet, for we are made for an end, we're made for a goal, we're made for an objective that we cannot achieve on our own. And I'm going to repeat that phrase because it is so key to a supernatural life. Again, we are made for an end, for a goal, for an objective we cannot reach on our own. Again, man is made for that end, an end that is far beyond what we can achieve naturally speaking. All creatures on earth, be they rabbits or fish or plants, can reach their goal by their own natural powers. When Mr. and Mrs. Rabbit bring forth little bunnies. They have reached their perfection. They brought, they brought forth the, their species. They continued their species. But with men, with women, things are quite different. Granted, we do have secondary goals, bringing forth family members, having careers, going off to get educated. But we're mainly made, ultimately made, for heaven above. Granted that human beings have these goals, that first goal is to make it to heaven by the power of the grace of our blessed Lord. Now, this ultimate goal is something that is supernatural. It's an end that is above nature and therefore beyond our natural powers and natural abilities. 
In short, men are made for a supernatural end that requires supernatural life and supernatural abilities in order to obtain it. We need a special gift, a gift that comes from God only, a gift called sanctifying grace. And that is why all of us must reject that great error which is so present in modern men, including many men within Holy Church. That is the problem of naturalism. This liberal and ultimately Masonically inspired heresy believes that through natural reasoning and natural abilities, man can find full perfection and even eternal life. The Catholics, we should know the real truth. Without the grace of God, without God's divine life within our souls, Our situation is truly helpless. Our Lord, the Last Supper, said, without me you can do nothing. He didn't say, without me you can't do anything real well. He said, without me you can do nothing. But this hopeless situation that we have, trying to reach a goal we can't get to on our own, was taken care of at the very creation of man. Knowing that his creature, man, was made for a supernatural end, The Almighty created Adam and Eve in the state of grace, thus providing the means that they needed to arrive at that lofty goal of heaven. Now, such teachings of Christ and Holy Mother Church should cause us to think about supernatural realities, especially during parish missions, where we think often about those last things, those four last things, death, judgment, heaven, And yes, hell. At our death, we will be judged according to supernatural grounds only, not on whether we were a nice person according to the world's estimation. If we have sanctifying grace in our souls, we will be judged with mercy. But if we ultimately reject this supernatural gift through unrepented mortal sin, or if we end up climbing a man-made mountain instead of the mountain of God that he gave us, we will forfeit the goal for which we were created, ending up in the pit or the abyss of hell. We were made for heaven, and it would be the greatest of tragedies if we failed to get there. Every other achievement, every other accomplishment, having a family, getting a college degree, being successful in business, all this would be utterly worthless if we fail to reach the goal for which we were made. An acorn may look good. An acorn might be a very healthy acorn. But if it does not become a tree, it is a failure. Just a few years ago, the magazine U.S. News and World Report had an article, and it was entitled, Hell Hath No Fury. In fact, the front cover of the magazine showed a number of occupants in hell, sitting on lawn chairs with sunglasses and sipping cocktails. The article concluded that modern man has a new view of hell that is not necessarily in line with the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Allow me to give you a quotation from this article from the magazine. Quote, With fire and brimstone going out of fashion, modern thinking says that the netherworld isn't so hot after all. The paragraph in this article continues, modern, educated Americans would reject notions of a blazing underworld where anguished souls writhe in endless torment. A literal hell to modern man is part of an understanding of a cosmos that just doesn't exist anymore. Well, let us go from the ridiculous, sublime, and erroneous, rather the ridiculous teachings of the world to the sublime and perfect teachings of Christ in his holy church. Catechisms have always taught us the following, quote, The teaching of the church affirms the existence of hell and its eternity. Immediately after death, the souls of those who die in a state of mortal sin descend into hell, where they suffer the punishments of hell, namely eternal fire. Our dear Lord stated, that the road to hell was wide and there were many who would travel this path while the road to heaven was very narrow and few there are that walk that way. But perhaps a better proof text for the fact that hell is real and it is actually populated right now as we speak 
is from a verse of the letter of St. Jude. A good Bible reading to have tonight even, since it's only one chapter long. Verse 7 from the Apostle St. Jude says the following, quote, Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns, states the Apostle, indulged in sexual promiscuity and practiced unnatural vice. And they serve as an example as they presently undergo a punishment of eternal fire. Note the adverb, presently undergo eternal fire. And let me correct those modern scripture scholars who might say that perhaps these people were thrown into hell because of their lack of hospitality. They didn't provide the angels maybe a cup of coffee or a knish. No, they were condemned because of sodomitical practices, plain and simple. Although heaven's gates were closed after Adam's sin, the gates of hell were never closed. They were always open, but only had a one-way opening. Not only are demons present in fires below, but also men who have been damned. If hell is somehow empty of human souls at this moment, then the Holy Bible, our dear Lord, and our Lady of Fatima are are somehow somehow untrustworthy. Before the modern age, Catholics had no trouble with hell being occupied. Christ Jesus stated that Judas, for example, was a son of perdition, a son of loss, that it would have been better if he had never been born, and that he went to his own place. The Roman Catechism, issued by the great council of Trent, taught the following, quote, Judas hanged himself and thus lost his soul and his body, and that his apostleship brought him nothing but everlasting destruction. Roman Catechism. The author Dante, who Father has mentioned a few times, placed Judas in the very mouth of Satan in hell itself. And when that disgusting and, yes, disgraceful Borgia Pope, Alexander VI, died, his successor forbade the requiem masses to be offered for his soul, stating that it would be blasphemy to pray for the damned. How things have changed. How things have changed. In our modern world, we even have a group of Jesuit priests in recent past who started an unofficial canonization process for Judas the traitor. And in a recent book called The Passover Plot, a modern scripture scholar suggests that Judas was actually working behind the scenes with the willing Jesus to bring about the fulfillment of prophecy. Judas then was but a loving catalyst to our salvation, making him a true disciple and a cause for our own salvation. Now, in the Holy Gospel, a man asked our dear Lord, will only a few people be saved? Today, many feel that all will be saved. Universal or near-universal salvation is a common belief. Dare we hope that everyone is going to heaven is a question that's asked by some. And whether there are any souls in hell or which individual souls might be in hell has not been revealed to us. Just read St. Jude's letter. Some modern theologians tell us that it's unoccupied. In a diocesan newspaper, not too long ago, in a diocesan newspaper in Kentucky, they had an edited version of the St. Michael prayer. It began this way. St. Michael thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits. Not a bad beginning. But then the prayer continued in this paper. That is, dear St. Michael, until the Lord has said enough and allows Lucifer to return home by the way of the foot of the cross, where at the feet of Jesus, Lucifer will find salvation. Again, let us go from the ridiculous, the heresy of universalism to the truth. The saints and doctors of Holy Church have a far less sanguine view of the salvation of the human race. The fathers of the Church, including Saints Irenaeus, Basil, and Cyril of Jerusalem, believe that the majority of the human race will end up below. St. Augustine admitted that many will come to heaven. The Bible says there are countless souls up there but that the number of the saved is greatly exceeded by the number of the damned. St. John Chrysostom, albeit it was an exhortative sermon, but still it is a father of the church, St. John Chrysostom states, 
Among thousands of people, there are not a hundred who will not arrive at their salvation. And I'm not sure even about that number. So much perversity is there amongst the young and so much negligence amongst the old. On July 13th, 1917, Our Lady of Fatima showed a vision of an occupied hell. Not just a hell, but an occupied hell to three seers. Later, Blessed Jacinta of Fatima, who saw hell, said, So many people are going to die, and many of them are going to hell. So many people are falling into hell. Sister Lucia, another of the visionaries whose cause for beatification opened up in 2008, Sister Lucia saw an occupied hell. She once wrote, Taking into account the behavior of mankind, only a small part of the human race will be saved. Now, many don't like to use those quotations from the saints, from the doctors, and from actually those who have seen a vision of hell itself. Many are concerned that such quotations may bring about a lessening of hope or even outright despair. But modern men need to hear this now. Men need to hear this in order to avoid another sin against hope, which is that of presumption, where a man sins at will and assumes that he will be forgiven. That's why I always remember what St. Alphonsus de Liguori teaches. He who abuses the mercy of God too much will be abandoned by God. Now you must ask, what are the punishments which are in the pit of hell, which we want to avoid? There's a twofold punishment. The pain of loss, which consists in obviously being deprived of seeing God face to face, but also the pain of sense, which consists of suffering caused by an outside material thing, namely a mysterious fire. Yes, the pain of loss. That's the very essence of what damnation is. One could lose their wallet. One could lose a special piece of jewelry. One could lose even their beloved spouse. But to lose the good Lord, the only one who can make us ultimately happy, is a loss beyond our imagining. But it's that secondary pain, that secondary pain associated with hell, although it's not essential, it's the one that most think of. Fire, the pain of sense. It is a teaching of Holy Mother Church that there is a real yet mysterious fire that continuously burns, inflicting a true punishment upon the damned. And the reason this is 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 fairly obvious. See, a mortal sin, which is a grave crime against the laws of God, has a double element to it. What is a mortal sin? First of all, it's a turning away from the good Lord, turning your back on the good Lord. But it is also turning towards a created thing in a perverse and twisted way. And so if a mortal sin has two elements to it, it's going to have two punishments to it. For the person who's turned away from God, well, their punishment is that they will not see God face to face. And if they've turned towards a created thing in a perverse and twisted way, seeing that created thing as their end, which they have embraced, well, then creation will be part of their punishment. It's going to afflict them in the form of fire. And that secondary punishment of hell, namely the pain of sense, may not be the essential pain, but it's the one that most think about. Oftentimes the fear of pain, the fear of eternal torture, causes that gut-wrenching fear that brings about the beginnings of conversion. In other words, a person who might be in, in habitual sin, continuously committing mortal sins, if, you're told, if he is told that he's not going to see the face of God one day, he may not be impressed. I'm doing fine without him. But if he were told that he might have to suffer excruciating pain for all eternity, that just might get his attention. Hellfire is real. Our Lord mentions everlasting fires in the Gospels. He speaks about a fire that is not extinguished. He speaks about a furnace of fire. And who, by the way, revealed hell to us? Was it the prophet Ezekiel or one of the raging prophets of the Old Testament or St. John the Baptist? Even No. Jesus Christ revealed hell. He is the one that taught this teaching, this dogma. And when he taught about hell, it is interesting. 
he used a pictorial. He used a picture of something the Jews would be very familiar with. He spoke about a place called Gehenna. That was what hell was. And that brought a picture to the mind of the Jews. Gehenna. You see, Gehenna in the Holy Land was a place where there was a pit. There was a constant fire going on in that pit. And there was a false god, a demon really, named Moloch. And the priests of Moloch would have a band playing around the pit. The fires would be raging. And people would come and they would offer their offering to the demon Moloch in the form of their children, sometimes newborn children. Because they were promised that if they brought their children to the god Moloch, they would receive good fortune in their life. Then the priests would take this offering of a baby and would throw that into the fires below. And that band was playing very loudly, especially at these moments of sacrifice, to cover up the screams of the young ones in order the parents would not have second thoughts. That's the image our Lord gave of hell. It is Gehenna. This was passed on then by the apostle St. John. The beloved disciple writes, The godless shall have their portion in the pool burning with fire and brimstone, and they shall be tormented night and day forever and ever. This apostolic teaching then passed on through the magisterium in the person of Pope Pelagius I, quote, A very just judgment to the punishment of eternal and indistinguishable fire. They may burn there without end. Holy Church finally also affirms the existence of hell, and also its eternity. That is the mystery. Everybody can accept there's a place of punishment. We have jails on earth. We understand there's wardens and there's jail people, there's criminals. We understand that. But there's always a terminus. There's always a limit to the punishment that men can give below. Even if a person had 20 life sentences, it still has some limit to it. But eternity, once dead, a man in mortal sin cannot repent. He cannot seek mercy because he's died in such a way that he has not let go of his sin and he has not embraced the God of mercy. And also this mystery of eternity forever and ever and ever somehow makes the penalty fit the crime. Because God, our our good God is an infinite God. Any offense we commit against him ultimately is an infinite offense. Somehow eternity becomes an infinite punishment. St. Alphonsus Liguori, doctor of Holy Church. St. Alphonsus Liguori writes, Were hell not eternal, it wouldn't be hell. Torments which continue but a short time are not a severe punishment. The man who might be afflicted with cancer submits to the knife because he knows that since the pain will soon be over, it is not fully torturous. The pain is very sharp, of course, but it will be over soon. But should that incision last for a whole week of cutting, a whole month or a whole year of incisions, how frightful would be his agony? What then must hell be like, St. Alphonsus asks, where the damned are compelled and forced to suffer for all eternity? With this in mind, one wouldn't dare commit a mortal sin if it meant being locked up in a prison for 20 years. But we're not talking about 20 years here. We're not talking about 30 years here, not even 100,000 years. We're talking about eternity. One never gets out of hell. And there is never any relief. And for those who might erroneously suggest that hell is not eternal that somehow people eventually get out or maybe are moved up to limbo so they probably have less pain. Such erroneous teachings cast doubt on the eternity of heaven. If I can somehow get out of hell and become heavenly, once I'm in heaven, can I lose heaven and go to hell? In conclusion, a thought to keep in mind. St. John Bosco was a great teacher and patron of youth. In addition, St. John Bosco received from God himself many, many vivid dreams regarding many things of our faith, including hell. This holy founder of the Salesians 
tells of a heavenly visitor who came to him one night. This heaven-sent guide told the saintly priest to follow him down a very beautiful and wide road with magnificent hedges and gorgeous flowers along each side. At first glance, this wide and beautiful road was level, was comfortable, but then it kept sloping downwards and downwards. And though it did not look that steep, St. John Bosco in his dream found himself moving ever more swiftly, almost as if he were effortlessly going down the road. The guide then brought the feast priest further along until they spotted many traps in the road. The traps in the ground were well concealed and they felt like spider webs, hardly visible. Each of the traps bore an inscription, the trap of pride, the trap of disobedience, the trap of envy, impurity of body, the trap of sloth and anger and other capital sins. And whenever an individual got caught in this web-like trap, a hideous monster would emerge and would seek to bring the victim downwards. But the holy priest also looked closely at those traps, and he found that various angels had placed knives near each trap that allowed an individual to cut himself free. The knives represented devotion to the most blessed of all sacraments, to the blessed Virgin Mary, other knife-like instruments that allowed people to become free. These traps included reading, spiritual reading, meditation, almsgiving. And as St. John Bosco was led further and further down that road to hell, he found that the beautiful hedges, all those flowers and sun-scorched had become sun-scorched, leafless and dead. The sloping road was also very steep now in descent, which caused the saint to fall several times. It was almost impossible to stand erect on the road to hell. But then the holy priest spotted, he spotted the very gates of hell. And above the gate of hell was the sign, the place of no reprieve. Meanwhile, St. John Bosco saw so many souls, countless individuals racing down that slope at uncontrollable speeds. And as each one crashed through the gates of hell, he noticed that each had on their forehead the sin that they had committed. Eventually, the heavenly guide brought the holy priest through the gates of hell into an immense cave. The entire cave was glowing white at temperatures of thousands of degrees. Yet the fire did not incinerate. It didn't consume anyone. So St. John Bosco then took a few more steps into the cave and saw all these poor wretches striking at each other like mad dogs. Others were even clawing at their own faces. And at this moment, the saints saw that the ceiling in the cave became transparent for a moment, allowing the damned to look above and to see all the blessed saints in heaven. The holy priest heard screams, blasphemies against the saints from the damned as they fumed with rage. And as the ceiling once again became darkened, St. John Bosco noticed that the damned were all covered with vermin. And it should be noted that the guest, or rather the guide, that was leading St. John Bosco along, asked him before he left to touch the wall of hell. Now, mind you, it should be noted, this was the very outer wall of hell, that there were thousands of walls between where he was and the actual hellfires below. The priest hesitated to touch the wall of hell, but then he did touch it. The sensation was so excruciating that the saint leapt back with a scream and found himself sitting up in bed, having awoken from his divinely sent dream. When he rose in the morning, his hand was still stinging with pain and was badly swollen. Later that week, the saint found that the skin on his palm had peeled completely off. Our God is El Shaddai, as the Bible says. He is a God who dwells on top of mountains. The road up this mountain, the one mountain of God, is very steep and it's very narrow. The terrain is especially difficult for men who are fallen like ourselves. It's so easy to go down. 
it is so difficult to go upwards. But knowing our condition, our pitiful condition, this God of the mountain willingly sent his only begotten son from on high to the Jericho here below, into the valley of our sinful human condition in order to suffer for us and to die for us, in order that we might be rescued from falling into this pit of hell and to restore us to the life of grace, that we might climb on high and see the face of God to reach that end for which we were made. At our holy baptisms, we chose to walk the narrow way and to reject Satan's wide road to perdition. With this in mind, let us renew our baptismal vows, the single most important promises we ever made when we rejected Satan and embraced the way of Christ. If you're able, please kneel. The proper response for this question or these series of questions is, I do renounce him. Do you renounce Satan? I do renounce him. And all his works, I do renounce him. And all his pomps, I do renounce him. The proper response for these questions is, I do believe. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was born and who suffered? I do believe. Do you believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? I do believe. Firmly I believe and truly God is three and God is one. And I next acknowledge duly manhood taken by the Son. And I trust and hope most fully in that manhood crucified. And I love supremely solely Christ, who for my sins has died. And I hold in veneration for the love of him alone, Holy Church as his creation, and her teachings as his own. Praise and thanks be ever given with and through the angel host to the God of earth and heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. May the Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath regenerated thee by water and the Holy Ghost, and who hath given thee the remission of all thy sins at baptism, keep thee free from serious sin and safe from eternal hellfire. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.